Tonight, how could this happen? Parents' devastation, the deadly mistake at a Bunbury hospital that cost their baby boy's life. That destroyed her family within a moment. A pregnant mother given an overdose of morphine, her child stillborn. Plus, homes up in flames, lives under threat. The race to stay ahead of a fast-moving bushfire raging out of control in Perth's south. The frantic search for survivors of Indonesia's monster earthquake as the death toll soars. A hero teen rescues his elderly neighbour from her burning Mirabuka home. And Australian open chaos as COVID sidelines a plane load of tennis players. <clears throat> this is Nine News Perth with Jerry DeMassey. Good evening. Houses have been gutted and properties ravaged by a bushfire threatening lives in our southern suburbs. Oakford residents have been forced to flee or stay and fight. Lucy McLeod is in the fire zone. Lucy, conditions are making this a fast moving and unpredictable emergency. That's right, Jerry. Have a look for yourself. This blaze behind me is scarily close to a home in Encatel and it has just torn through another property. It is moving quickly towards the freeway and I'm sure you can see uh, these fast moving winds. That's what's pushing it. This smoke out here is thick and it's making it difficult to breathe. It's stinging the eyes. I don't know if you can hear the aircraft above. That's dropping uh, water and retardant to try and control this blaze. But these conditions have made it really difficult for crews on ground here. They've been trying to control this uh, for about seven hours now. It's already torn through over 100 hectares and it could double in size. Homes on fire, residents at risk. An out of control bushfire raging through our southern suburbs. Multiple buildings destroyed, sheds and a nursery lost. Vehicles also up in flames. Spot fires coming within metres of this Oakford property saved just in time. Residents forced to flee their homes in immediate danger from the fast-moving threat. It's quite scary, like this is our life, this is our, our whole life, like everything that we have is here. Well, I'm worried about the wind and livestock and everybody else that's in the street. We've had all the water running, we've got no power now, so we've watered the roofs and all that down that we could do, and then, yeah, we're just waiting now for them to say, if you've got to go, you've got to go. Some choosing to stay and fight. I won't be going anywhere. <laughs> I'm yeah. staying fighting. One homeowner saying he feared this day would come. Got about 14 years of undergrowth out there, nothing done with it, so... It had to burn one day. Even children joining the fight to defend homes. But as widespread fires continued to relentlessly tear through properties, it became too much for some. I'm going to miss my kid down here. I need something to be addressed on it, thanks. It's her house. OK, unless you see something with an address, there's not anything I can do about it. While others couldn't return home. We've been told to go back to the gas bottles on our property. They wanted them right with no entry. Livestock also evacuated. We can see just how close this fire is to homes only a few hundred metres away. Water bombers are doing what they can to protect them, but for the family that lives here on Newbold Road, it is too late to evacuate. They have to stay and defend their own home. More than 150 firefighters scrambling to get ahead of the unpredictable blaze. Crews driving into the unknown to face a raging fire front. The nightmare conditions fueled by soaring temperatures and fast, strong winds. It has been pretty strong and gusty through this afternoon. Um, we're anticipating that the same wind conditions are going to continue into the evening and overnight. Um, so you could potentially see gusts up to 40 or 50 k's an hour. Now, there doesn't appear to be any end in sight. Fire crews are expected to work through the night, even into, uh, into tomorrow and the next couple of days as these strong winds stick around and the weather heats up. Jerry, Lucy, you stay safe out there. Let's head straight to Jacqueline Robson now. Jackie, a large part of the freeway has been closed. Yes, Jerry, and for good reason. There is a very real risk this fire is going to jump the freeway at Ankatel Road. Homes on the western side are already under a watch and act alert. Firefighters are anticipating that outcome. Ankatel Road is where the freeway closure begins. It ends here at Mortimer Road where we are. The live chopper shots will show you just how serious this fire threat is. A number of local roads have also been closed due to the fire danger in Oakford. Thomas Road is 
is closed between Angatel Road and Bombay Boulevard. Motorists are being told to avoid this area. It's smoky, it's dangerous, there's already traffic chaos. We're told a large contingent of resources has just been sent to the Angatel end of this roadblock. There is concern the fire will light up the spectacles, putting more pressure on fire crews. And Jerry, it's likely that the freeway will remain closed into tonight. Jacqueline Robson, thank you. A family shattered by grief is searching for answers tonight after a devastating hospital mix-up robbed them of their baby boy. Sarah Hassan went to Bunbury Private Hospital to deliver her baby, but was left in a coma after a deadly morphine mistake. A warning to our viewers, the following story contains distressing details and images. A baby boy forever lost. His body was still warm. His mother left fighting for life in intensive care. What happened to my wife? A family shattered after a deadly morphine mix-up at Bunbury's private hospital. I was dreaming for a baby for a long time, for five years. It was devastating. It just broke my whole life. Five weeks ago, it was feared Sarah Hassan wasn't going to make it. She was suffering oxygen deprivation and heart failure after being given 100 milligrams of morphine, 10 times the prescribed dose. She survived, but the child they'd been hoping for for so long, Zaid, was stillborn. This was Sarah as she walked heavily pregnant and in labour into Bunbury's St John of God Hospital on December 9. Just hours after she was admitted, a midwife allegedly gave her the morphine to ease her pain. The thing is that I was asking every time to myself why I take the morphine. Because of that, I lost my child. The overdose put Sarah into a coma, her unborn baby dying inside her. But no one, not even her husband who slept beside her, knew what was happening until the next day. She went sleep within a moment, I think three to five minutes. But uh, I am not a medical person, you know. I thought that she, she was in a deep sleep, but I never ever believed that she, she, within that moment, she went in coma. The hospital says it feels deeply for the family, describing the incident as tragic and rare. It says their investigation will continue, but it's likely human error was to blame. Staff involved have been stood down as protocols and procedures are reviewed. Uh, to lose a child is beyond description. And um, so we all feel for the family there'll be a proper investigation by the authorities, both the Department of Health and the coroner. But for Sonny and Sarah, no action will bring baby Zaid back. Despite their anguish, the couple are speaking out about their ordeal in the hope it will stop it from happening to anyone else. That destroyed a family within a moment. That destroyed anyone's dream, who have been dreaming for a whole life, who have been dreaming for a baby, who have been dreaming for a family. If we have a baby, we have a family. But that's, that destroyed within a moment. Kelly Williams, Nine News. A third person on an Australian Open charter flight to Melbourne has now tested positive to COVID-19. It means more players, coaches and officials will go into hard lockdown as virus control measures ahead of the Grand Slam are put to the test. Thumbs up and away from Novak out of hotel quarantine and on the way to the court under police escort Serena Williams also had a wave while Naomi Osaka masked up, joining the world's tennis elite heading to practice ahead of the Australian Open. But Melbourne has a problem. You've got to think this is a worst case scenario for Tennis Australia. Just one day into what's being called the world's toughest virus measures, one of the air crew and a member of tennis staff tested positive for COVID after entering the country. Now everyone on their flight from LA, including players Victoria Azarenka and Kay Nishikori, won't be allowed to train, confined to their rooms for the 14 days. It's a hiccup in a huge logistical effort. For now, the Grand Slam is going ahead. We are running a hotel quarantine model to the highest standard. Music to the ears of our Premier as WA's hard border with Victoria softens on Monday. What we'll see is, I think, a very modest increase in the number of Victorians coming in because they still have to do um, quarantine and they still have to be tested. But Victorians will no longer require an exemption to enter WA after 10 days without community transmission. Queensland currently at four and New South Wales zero. The magic number is 28 days for WA's hard border to crumble. New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland are a way off of having border restrictions removed. 
uh, and that's because we're ultra cautious. Caution is what saw National Cabinet agree to slashing international arrivals by 50%, including here in Perth. But last night, Emirates abruptly suspended flights for Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, leaving stranded Aussies overseas less options to come home. One is Danny Mansuti, who recently learned her February 3 flight home was cancelled, just as Tennis Australia was chartering 15 flights to bring 1,240 players and officials into the country. I've had to dig into savings and pay five figures for a flight that I don't know if it's going ahead or not. And to pay that much money and not know is deeply terrifying, especially when you're trying so hard to get back. Today, the federal government announced 20 extra flights above the existing passenger caps to help bring more Aussies home. Perth said to stay capped at 512 overseas passengers. I wouldn't expect we'd go above that number. WA's COVID number today, two new cases in hotel quarantine and the sweet sound of nine months, no community spread. Jacqueline Robson, Nine News. Industries are vying for a spot at the head of the queue in the second phase of the vaccine rollout. Vulnerable Australians and frontline health officials are getting the jab in the coming months, but there are other workers who want priority too. Vials of hope to stay ahead of the COVID health crisis. Australians who are most at risk could be vaccinated within weeks and there are now others who want to be next in line. Every business, I'm sure, will want to be at the front of the queue and, and that is absolutely understandable. The first Australians to get the jab will be quarantine and border workers, frontline health officials and workers and residents in disability and aged care. Industry groups are calling for workers in manufacturing, education education and tourism to be in the second phase of the rollout strategy. We're putting forward what we see as the main areas uh, that could, could be of benefit from the point of view of getting biggest bang for the buck, if you like. The federal government says the priority during the rollout will be safety, while keeping the economy as open and strong as possible. And we'll be getting the health advice on how to do that. It's argued vaccinating sectors such as manufacturing would shore up Australia's supply chain to deliver critical stock like health equipment and groceries, as well as strengthen trade relationships marred by international border closures. Then we could very well see a much more rapid recovery uh, than what otherwise may have been achieved. Labor isn't buying it, saying the government hasn't bought into enough options. They haven't signed enough deals and they haven't obtained enough doses. The Prime Minister has said a vaccine will be a key step in the country's economic recovery, with the goal of having 4 million Australians vaccinated by the end of March. There's still a long way to go to make 2021 a better year. Emma LaRouche, Nine News. The death toll from the devastating 6.2 magnitude earthquake which struck Indonesia has risen to 67. More search and rescue equipment is being sent from Jakarta as teams scramble to find anyone who might still be alive. A glimmer of hope amid a hopeless situation. A lone Sulawesi survivor, one of the fortunate few. Dozens of others didn't stand a chance. A five-storey hospital among the flattened buildings. Other structures left standing, barely recognisable. The 6.2 quake rocked Sulawesi Island, six kilometres northeast of Medjeni City, with a population of 60,000. Help is coming from Jakarta. Ships and planes bringing supplies and search equipment. Indonesian President Joko Widodo urged people to stay calm and follow the instructions given by officials on the ground. Rain, power cuts and poor mobile phone service are hampering painstaking rescue efforts. The disaster, a hammer blow for the island during a period of COVID self-isolation. Of course, that stress and that psychological you know, sense of and, and emotional stress will increase. This was the second quake in two days to hit the so-called Ring of Far region. Indonesia's devastating history with earthquakes and tsunamis means the grim arrival of body bags is an all too familiar sight. Steve Marshall, Nine News. A 20-year-old man is in a bad way tonight, run over by a four-wheel drive in South Kalgoorlie. The pedestrian suffered critical injuries when he fell under the Toyota Hilux that was just after 1am. 
and a motorbike rider has been killed in a crash in Perth South. The 57-year-old was riding on Stock Road in Munster when he lost control of his bike around 6 o'clock this morning. The man died at the scene. An Islamic State sympathiser is back behind bars tonight, little more than a fortnight since his release from jail. Federal police swooped on the man's home this morning after he allegedly accessed extremist content online. A new year, but the same old habits according to the AFP. The man has an extremist ideology aligned to the ISIS terror network. 25-year-old Radwan Dagag was arrested this morning after just two weeks of freedom. The early morning raids spooking the quiet, leafy neighbourhood of Deniston, where Dakak was staying with his cousin. Um, he was arrested, yeah. breached with his uh, probation, but that's all I'm going to say. We will allege the man failed to comply with the condition of his control order by accessing material online that supported the carrying out of executions, beheadings and torture. Has he been on the computer looking at certain things, like, such as beheadings? No comment. Dakak was previously sentenced to 18 months jail for associating with a member of a terrorist organisation. He was then arrested with mate Isaac Almatari, a self-described IS leader of Australia who pleaded guilty in October to planning attacks across Sydney. Dakak was released in January on a year-long control order. With our continued monitoring of his control order and his behaviour, we were able to act quickly and identify his breach before it escalated into anything else. The dramatic development highlights a worrying trend for the AFP. Over the past six months, five people convicted of terror-related offences have been arrested for allegedly breaching their control orders. Dakak faced Parramatta local court and was refused bail. Steve Marshall, Nine News. Donald Trump will leave the White House for Florida just hours before Joe Biden is sworn in, with reports he's asked for a major send-off involving Air Force One. Security threats have hampered preparations for the inauguration, but the president-elect says he feels safe. Pennsylvania Avenue, the famous street linking the Capitol to the White House, deserted. Today's rehearsal of the inauguration cancelled due to security concerns. We cannot allow a recurrence of the chaos and illegal activity that the United States and the world witnessed last week. Police officers involved in that Capitol Hill chaos have now started speaking out, like Michael Fanone, who was dragged down steps and says he was tasered several times. And then some guys started getting a hold of my gun. They were screaming out, you know, kill him with his own gun. Joe Biden today attacked Republicans for refusing to wear masks during the siege after several Democrats later tested positive. What the hell's the matter with that? The president-elect revealing just how he plans to administer 100 million coronavirus vaccine doses in his first 100 days. Within the first month of our administration, we're going to deploy mobile clinics. Mr Biden only answering one question with one word at today's briefing. Do you feel safe or not safe based on the intelligence that you've seen? Yes. In the absence of the outgoing president, Mike Pence extended an olive branch to the new administration, finally calling Vice President-elect Kamala Harris to congratulate her. As Washington prepares for inauguration, the timeline of Donald Trump's impeachment remains uncertain. While it's anticipated the trial will start within a week, today House Speaker Nancy Pelosi refused to comment on when she'll send the articles to the Senate. In Washington, D.C., Tim Arvia, Nine News. It's time for weather now with Elizabeth Creasy. Liz, a hot afternoon. Well, Jerry, that heat continued to build well into this afternoon with the city recording a maximum of 34.2 degrees at 4 p.m. That's because we failed to get much of a sea breeze once again today. It was also very sticky last night. The mercury only dropping below 20 degrees at 1.30 this morning with our minimum coming just before 6 a.m. Now, it is going to be another hot night tonight. It won't drop below 21 degrees and it will get even 
even warmer tomorrow. But on the east coast, Victoria is in the middle of a cold snap with Mount Buller getting a very light dusting of snow. While January snow is rare, it is not unheard of, but it's probably not quite enough to get the skis out just yet. But I will have the rest of this weekend's forecast for you a little later, Jerry. Thank you, Liz. We'll see you then. A Perth grandmother trapped in her burning home. The teenage neighbour who risked his life to save hers. That's next. Plus, a new police task force to hunt online predators targeting young gamers. A driver's narrow escape as a car burns on a suburban road. And later, farewell to the man who steered one of the great Australian rock groups to the very top. A Perth teenager is being hailed a hero after rescuing his elderly neighbour from her burning home. The Mirabooka grandmother tripped over her walking frame while trying to escape the flames. A Mirabooka home turned inferno. Oh. Ferocious flames shooting through the roof, destroying everything in their path. They just sound like loud crackling, like thunder, and then windows shattering. 18-year-old Elijah Stacey didn't flinch as the fire engulfed his neighbour's home, risking his life to save hers. We see an old lady laying on the floor bleeding and then that's when we just got her to safety, picked her up and carried her outside. The 80-year-old had tripped over in the doorway trying to escape. Happened pretty quickly, hey? Very quickly. So I don't, I don't know, she's very lucky that she survived, really. It's not known what sparked the fierce blaze yesterday afternoon. The house too far gone by the time firefighters arrived. All they could do was stop it spreading to other properties. It was being fanned by a strong easterly wind, blowing the flames and the embers across the fences. The grandmother was taken to hospital with minor injuries. She may have lost her home, but thanks to her brave neighbours, not her life. A little bit shocked, but that's right. Hopefully she's safe and sound and hopefully see her around. You need that community spirit and um, hopefully the community will learn about smoke alarms and the, uh, the value of them. Louise Rennie, Nine News. A motorist has had a lucky escape from a car fire in Kareem. The man was driving his Hyundai on Oakley Road just after 6 o'clock last night when the vehicle caught fire. He managed to pull over and get out before flames took hold. It took firefighters 20 minutes to extinguish the blaze. Authorities say it was sparked by a mechanical fault. The entire Dutch government has resigned over a child welfare payment scandal which saw more than 20,000 families wrongly accused of fraud. The move is seen as mostly symbolic though as Parliament was due to break up ahead of a March election. A new specialist police unit has been set up to track down online predators using video game chat rooms to prey on children. The pandemic has seen a rise in reports of child abuse material with the internet a playground for pedophiles. Headsets on, controllers at the ready, it's game time for the Elias brothers and they're spoiled for choice. Terraria and Rocket League and a bit of FIFA. But their parents always keep a close eye on who they're playing with. For the little one, the online chat function is switched off. Um, that just prevents him from, of course, reciprocating any conversation with people he's not familiar with. With good reason. The online world and games in particular are the street corner or, you know, the shopping mall of the 21st century. Victoria Police have launched Australia's first anti-exploitation unit aimed at gaming. Officers will target offenders using online game chat rooms to groom children. For them to put resources into this, it is clearly significant on their radar and it needs to be significant on the radar of parents. 8.4 million files of child abuse material were circulating on peer-to-peer -peer networks in December. There's also been a 30% rise in the number of IP addresses sharing the material online. We've had a doubling of reports into our office of child sexual abuse material. The eSafety Commissioner is urging parents to be alert, not alarmed. Others take it a step further. Make sure 
sure that they are acutely aware that a game is not a safe place for their child to be. It has to come with rules. The advice is to set parental controls and get to know the games your kids are playing instead of just leaving them to their own devices. We need to be engaged in their online lives the way we, way we are their everyday lives. If you give your child that access, you need to be able to be responsible enough to make sure your child is also protected. You can't just wash your hands off to the police. Elizabeth Moss, Nine News. Coming up, the latest on that bushfire emergency raging in our southern suburbs. Plus, why are there delays on the EU Pfizer rollout? An auction house under fire for selling a Nazi flag labelled abhorrent and a disgrace by a human rights group. And a tribute to the man who steered in excess to the top of world music. We're going to get an update now on that fire that's still burning out of control in Perth South this evening. Lucy McLeod, what is the latest out there? Well, the flames are still moving at speed. I've just been told they're threatening the freeway, threatening to jump the freeway, which means the Bilia Regional Park and surrounding areas are now under threat if they can't control this blaze uh, immediately. But it is putting a lot of pressure on crews. They're doing what they can as water and retardant is dropped from above. They've been battling this for almost eight hours uh, as this uh, has torn through over 100 hectares of bushland and some properties as well. The Quinana Freeway from Ankertel Road to Mortimer Road is closed as well as a number of local roads. The advice is to avoid the area completely, but there is no reprieve in sight uh, for crews. They're expected to work through the night and even over the next couple of days as these strong winds stick around and that weather heats up, Jerry. Looks awful out there. Stay safe, Lucy. Thank you. More than 2 million COVID deaths have now been recorded worldwide. The staggering total is the equivalent of the 10 full A380 planes crashing every day for the last year. It comes almost a year to the day since the first death from the virus was recorded in Wuhan. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has announced anyone arriving into the UK from Monday will have to self-isolate for 10 days. The period can be shortened if a negative COVID test is returned after day five. The tighter border restrictions come amid growing concerns over new variants of the virus. Shipments of the Pfizer vaccine from the US to six European Union nations have slowed to a level the countries are calling unacceptable. The pharmaceutical company says the delay is because it's currently changing its manufacturing process to boost production in the long term. The sale of a World War II Nazi flag has been slammed by human rights groups, labelling it an abhorrent and disgraceful act. But the auction house is defending its actions, arguing it's simply a piece of history. In April 1945, Canadian troops liberated the city of Groningen in the Netherlands. This flag flew over the Luftwaffe compound. Almost 76 years on, it's gone under the hammer in an online auction on the Gold Coast. 1,700 and we're selling, going once, 1,700 going twice, 1,700. Congratulations, that's fine bidding. The 2.8 metre flag is made up of a large swastika, symbol of the Nazi party, and still widely regarded as a symbol of hate. The Anti-Defamation Commission has labelled its sale as a disgrace, claiming no one should profit from such an item. This auction is a spit on the grave of every digger who gave their lives to defeat Hitler's regime. And it's a kick in the stomach to the Holocaust survivors living here. The seller, a wartime antiquities collector from Queensland, has had the flag in his possession for 40 years. Well, he's 85 now and downsizing and he's refining his collection. Since its listing on Monday, the auction house has been inundated with dozens of angry emails calling for the flag to be destroyed. It's not an illegal item, it's legal. And while it's legal, uh, we can sell it. History teaches us how to go forward as a society, so you must remember what happened, not glorify it. This is an antiquity from that time. The Anti-Defamation Commission is calling for a change in legislation. I also call on the state and federal government to do the right thing and to ban the sale of Nazi memorabilia. Catherine Foran, Nine News. Drums, guitars, saxophone, the voice in excess had them all, but it was a man behind the scenes who played a huge role in their rise to fame and fortune. That man, Chris Murphy, has died aged 66. Members of the band this evening praising his vision and his passion. Yeah. 
They made the music. He made sure they made some money. The rewards for their rise from clubs and pubs of Sydney to the world stage. Every single one of us, the devil inside. Chris Murphy, who started as a booking agent, inherited the role of steering the band almost by accident, gifted the job by a management overburdened, looking after both Midnight Oil and In Excess. Murphy had once described In Excess singer Michael Hutchins as pretty weird, but the partnership that began in the early 80s would create a musical tidal wave. In Excess had the songs and the style and the swagger to be world beaters, absolutely. But it was Chris Murphy and his management that sealed the deal and made sure they realised their potential. Murphy guided in excess to big record contracts in the US and masterminded their phenomenal headline act at Wembley in 91. Right from the very beginning, he marketed them and positioned them as an international band, even though they came from the northern beaches of Sydney. His engagement with In Excess wound up in 1995, two years before the death of Michael Hutchins. Then, in 2008, he took on the band once again through another hit album, dabbling meanwhile with other musical projects and organic farming. But it is the glory days when Michael Hutchins pranced and sang and cavorted out front, for which he will be best remembered. Mark Burroughs, Nine News. Still to come on Nine News, a bumper week for Perth's property market, plus behind the scenes of Hamilton before it hits the stage in Australia, and the four-legged intruder who took a stroll through an ambulance station. But first, here's Josh Dorr with Sport Josh. A storm has rained on Australia's parade. Good evening, Jerry. Yes, Brisbane's fickle weather has left the fourth test on a knife's edge. Heavy rain puts a pause on the Aussies' plans. Will some late runs make the difference? An electric eagle lights up a derby defeat, and the Perth mayor running hot at Flemington. Welcome back. Australia's bid to press home a first innings advantage against India has been halted by a Brisbane downpour. The hosts reached 369 on the back of runs from Tim Payne and the tail, with India two down for 62 when rain hit during the tea break. With the platform set on day one, a big score was there for the taking. Just stands and delivers green. Yoda certainly liked what he was seeing. Mohamed Siraj not quite so much, even with a bit of help from his teammate. Tim Payne passing 50, only to be dismissed the very next ball. Eggs and gone, Robert Sharma. Three short of his own half century, Green also fell. Oh, gets him with a straight one. When Pat Cummins was dismissed, Australia had lost three for four, in turn bringing the milestone man to the crease. Oh, a of a shot from Nathan Lyon. The tail adding some important late runs before Josh Hazelwood was finally knocked over. Balls in. Bowling first change, Cummins then took two balls to strike. Rohit Sharma was in such ominous touch, even his defensive shots were going for four. Enter Nathan Lyon, whose 100th test was proving fruitful. The catch is on and taken. That's when a downpour hit, the Gabba flooded in minutes. But just as quickly, the water receded. Tim Payne seemingly a little perplexed when play was abandoned without a ball being bowled in the final session. Clearly we wanted to get back out there. Um, Spectators want us to get back out there, but the decision was made by the, the officials, and that's their role. Ayrton Woolley, nine years. Despite a half century from Liam Livingston, the Scorchers are locked in a tough battle for their sixth win in a row. Dropped on three, the import set about making the Sydney Sixers pay, hitting one out of Monica Roval the very next over. Gone for oh. that, that's massive. That is out of the ground. On the roof, downtown towards Parliament. Perth then imploding, losing five wickets for 39, setting Sydney 164 to win. Josh Philippi notching up a half century of his own in a flying start for the Sixers. With four out on the leg side and he gets that in the gap. The West Aussie falling 15 runs short of a century. A short time ago, the Sixers were three for 148. 
Live Wire forward Ashling McCarthy has given Eagles fans plenty to be excited about heading into their second AFLW season. The recruit booting three goals in a pre-season derby defeat to the Dockers. The Dockers with unfinished business following last year's shutdown, but an Eagles recruit strutted her staff. Ashling McCarthy making an immediate impression, booting three first-term majors. She was a star for the Bulldogs last year and, and I played on her when, when we played the Bulldogs last year. So um, I was really happy that she came across to us and um, it was always going to be something that, that was going to be exciting and she definitely showed that. I think we'll play a game style that will really suit her footy. Fremantle eventually clicking into gear. Sabrina Duffy and Gemma Houghton bagging two goals each in the 10-point win. Midfielder Steph Kane completing a successful return after a year out following a knee reconstruction. She's put a hell of a lot of work into herself and her body in the last six months and for her to come out today and, you know, she, didn't, she looked very confident. With skipper Cara Antonio resting, Ebony led the tune-up. Two weeks of quarantine putting footy in perspective. It's kind of a bit of a blessing in disguise. It made me want it even more, so I'm raring to go in a couple of weeks' time. The Eagles still bound for Queensland to face Gold Coast in round one. Hopeful the league will avoid a hub-style fixture. It's a massive sacrifice for, for our girls to have to balance that with, I guess, their second lives as well. So um, that would be an absolute uh, challenge and something that would be uh, really hard to do. Jimmy Williams, Nine News. Perth Mayor Fabergino has continued her hot form in the East. The Tiana Robertson trained six-year-old picking up a second straight win at Flemington, cruising to victory in the Kensington Stakes. Fabergino in front. She's simply fabulous, the Mayor from WA. She's going to win again. A giant payday for Hugh Bowman and Chris Waller at the Magic Millions with the star pair causing a boil over in the two-year-old classic with Shaquiro. And a huge team effort has helped the Lakers extend their NBA winning streak to five games. After wearing a few early blows from the Pelicans, LA steadied in a 17-point victory with six players scoring double digits. LeBron James leading the way with 21. Kuzma hangs, can't finish, but LeBron over the top with a one-handed stuff. Last night, Melbourne United kicked off the NBL season in style, blowing the Adelaide 36ers away in the second half, much to the frustration of home coach Connor Henry. You've over dribbled, you, I've over dribbled, you over dribbled, you haven't even played. Keeping their cool, pre season favourites United winning 89 to 65. I don't think they'll be miking up Connor Henry anytime soon, Jerry. Very tough, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, JD. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Still to come, there's been an extraordinary surge in Perth home sales this week. More on Property Watch next. Plus, paramedics give chase to a four-legged intruder and your very first sneak peek at the hit Broadway show Hamilton, about to open in Australia. Welcome back. Let's take a look at the biggest headlines making news in Perth this evening. Multiple properties have been destroyed in a blaze burning out of control at Oakford. The fire is so big it has closed a section of the freeway. A heartbroken couple has spoken out after a midwife at a Bunbury hospital administered so much morphine to the pregnant woman it killed their unborn baby. A Perth teenager has rescued his elderly neighbour from her burning home. The Mirabooka grandmother was tripped as she was trying to escape. And a third person on an Australian Open charter flight to Melbourne has tested positive to COVID-19. Excitement is building with Broadway's award-winning mega-hit Hamilton about to open in Australia. The show is delivering a much-needed boost to the performing arts industry and Grace Fitzgibbon went behind the curtains for a sneak peek. It's the biggest Broadway show in decades. The first time I'm thinking past tomorrow. And straight from the Great White Way to the Harbour City. The Australian premiere of Hamilton just weeks away from hitting Sydney Lyric Theatre. An army of creatives hard at work behind the scenes to create the spectacular costumes which become magic on stage. They're all such beautiful hand period designs that look simple but um, they're so complicated. Kylie Clark is one of 15 wig makers working on the production. It's a meticulous process. Each wig takes around 60 hours to complete. 
So everything is completely handmade. Every hair is individually knotted into the wig. Down the hall, it's all about the shoes. Each pair handcrafted for the cast to ensure maximum flexibility for hours of dancing. I get to make the most beautiful things and see them dance on stage and you know, that's fantastic. A shoemaker of 45 years, Jody Morrison, says COVID-19 has brought a whole new challenge. I only saw some people this week that we'd Skyped for fittings. A similar struggle for those in charge of the world-famous gowns and tailored suits. Tight restrictions on overseas imports slowing down production. It's just simple things like today we found out we can't buy pins, we can't buy thread because it comes in from China. By the time the costumes hit the stage they will have been around 12 months in the making and it takes an army. The pre-production team alone made up of more than 65 people. All of the hard work set to go up in lights in March. Rehearsals kick off in just over a week. Grace Fitzgibbon, Nine News. Activity in the Perth property market skyrocketed out of a holiday slump this week with sales jumping by more than 180%. Nine Property Watch shows there were 8,263 properties for sale this week and according to Rewa.com data, 695 are under offer or have been sold. Our top selling suburbs this week, Baldivis, Scarborough, Ellenbrook and Rockingham. At the top end of the market, this eight-year-old $2.35 million five-bed bedroom home in Nedlands and how is this big home among the gum trees in Wandi the property complete with its air-conditioned gym room in a 300 square meter warehouse selling for 1.3 million dollars. At the other end of the market, this two-bedroom Kelmscott Villa sold at $195,000 and this three-bedroom home in a quiet private pocket in Rockingham sold for $280,000. Well, it's not just kids who need a lullaby. A new study showing music can be the key to a better night's sleep for adults. But not all types of music are beneficial. Researchers at the University of New South Wales have found the best music for getting to sleep has lower frequencies, such as a stronger bass, with a slow and sustained duration of musical notes. A curious koala has taken a stroll through an ambulance Victoria Excuse headquarters me. checking out the vehicle and supplies, but it was just a short tour of the branch, the marsupial making a beeline for the exit as it was shooed out by a paramedic. Probably tired from the adventure, the little local seemed a bit disheartened as he made a journey up a nearby tree. Time for another look at weather now with Elizabeth Creasy. Liz, it's going to be a hot end to the week. Well, Jerry, it is going to remain very warm tonight with a sunny maximum of 36 tomorrow afternoon and there's more hot weather on the way next week before a cool change. I'll have the forecast next. Welcome back. It's been a hot and sunny Saturday with perfect conditions for a day at the beach and the temperature is still quite warm at the moment because we haven't really had much of a sea breeze this afternoon. Right now it's still hovering just below 32 degrees. Earlier we had a maximum of 34 after an overnight low of 18. And it was another windy morning for our eastern suburbs with gusts getting up to 91 kilometres an hour at Gooseberry Hill at 7.30 this morning. Bickley also recorded a gust of 76 kilometres an hour. Turning to the satellite and a tropical low near the Cocos Islands is expected to strengthen into a cyclone tonight while another tropical low could develop over WA waters next week. Heading into state, Brisbane will be partly cloudy tomorrow, 22 to 29 degrees, sunny in Sydney, 26, and windy and wet in Hobart, 19 degrees there. Back in WA, there's the chance of some storms for Kununurra, Broome and Marble Bar, heading for a top of 41 degrees in Marble Bar and 40 in Port Hedland. Those storms could stretch down to Geraldton and Durian, where it will also be very hot, 39 the top for both centres, and it will be a windy 34 in Bunbury. 
Back around Perth, it's looking like another great day for the beach with easterly winds and seas and swell down to one or one and a half metres. It will be another windy morning for our eastern suburbs and it's looking pretty hot right across the board. Tops of 35 degrees for the metro area. In the city, it will be slightly hotter, 21 to 36. And it looks like we have a bit of a mixed bag next week. It will be very hot to start the day on Monday with a minimum of 24 degrees. 34 will be the maximum, heating up to 38 degrees on Tuesday and hovering around 35 degrees on Wednesday and Thursday before we get a cool change, move through on Friday and Saturday. Tops of 29 for both of those days. Now this January has been particularly hot. We've only had two days below 30 degrees so far this month. So that cool change next weekend will be very welcome, Jerry. I'm looking forward to that, Liz. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. That's Nine News this Saturday. Thanks for your company. A current affairs next with Sylvia Jeffries. Enjoy your evening. Good night.